Welcome back to our series of videos on types of structural action. We're in chapter one, section six, subsection two, and we're on the fourth video designated by the capital letter D. Uh, we're looking at axial compression in this series of videos, and in this particular fourth video, we're looking at axial compression for spanning. So suppose we have an arch or a vault of this particular shape. Uh, and there's no difference between an arch and a vault, except that the vault typically has enough width that it can enclose some architecture. So it has to do with proportions more than anything else. So we have uh, an arch or a vault of this general shape. It's subjected to a uniform load W, which would be in pounds per foot or kips per foot. It's spanning a length L. And we want this to act like a true arch, which means we want it to be in compression and not subject to a bunch of spurious loading that would induce bending or something like that. So we would like to have a compressive buttressing force or a support force that's tangent to the direction of the member. If this support force has any component perpendicular to this member, it's gonna induce bending in the member. So we have to have that compressive force uh, along the length of the member, or in other words, tangent at the point of support. We can break that force up into a horizontal component and a vertical component. The vertical component is going to be half the total vertical load on the structural member. So we have um, a load W in pounds per linear foot. We have a span in feet. If we multiply W times L, that will be the total load, downward load or gravity force on this member. Half of that has to be supported at one end and half at the other. So we say this vertical support force at this support point is WL over 2. And that is imposed upon us, by the way, by the uh, design situation where we have a certain load W and a, sp a certain span L. And we can never violate that rule because in order for this member, uh, this spanning member to be in equilibrium, the two reactions at each end have to add up to the total load on the spanning member. H, which we call the horizontal buttressing force, has to be whatever it has to be in order to assure that the net force C is tangent to the member at the support point. Now, we can slice through this member and throw part of it away and create this object, which we call a free body. And we know by equilibrium that if there's a horizontal force in this direction, there has to be a horizontal force back in that direction in order to keep the thing from moving from left to right. Um, this force H and that force H do not have the same line of action. This one is along this line here. That one's along that line there. Because they're not collinear and they don't have the same line of action, they are tending to produce a counterclockwise revolution. There's an influence there, which we'll call the moment of the horizontal forces. And later in this course, we'll get into more detail about what a moment is. But for the moment, anyone with common sense can understand that if these two forces are not along the same line, they are tending to induce some kind of rotation. In this case, counterclockwise. Now, if we take this uniform load, which is distributed uniformly along the, uh, the length of half the arch, so that would be L over 2 is the total uh, um, expanse of this load W. So we multiply W times L over 2, we can, we can say that's the equivalent of all this distributed load, and it's going to be centered at the center of the distributed load. In other words, at the center of this half of the arch. So there's an offset here of L over 4, since the overall length of this free body is L over 2. So we have a vertical force here, a vertical force there. 
the two of them together are tending to induce clockwise rotation. So the vertical forces are tending to induce clockwise rotation. The horizontal forces are tending to induce counterclockwise rotation. And those influences, which we'll talk about more and more in this course, but right now we're going to just say those two influences have to counterbalance each other in order to assure that this piece that we're looking at, this free body, is actually in equilibrium. So an interesting question is, what happens when the buttressing force is removed or is just not provided? So here we have an example that um, we went through in the textbook in great detail, but for right now we're just going to sort of talk about the implications of it and provide a kind of an overview of it. It's a glue lamb arch that in cross section is three feet deep and its base dimension uh, in the cross section is one foot. Um, that is the size of arch that was calculated that would be necessary to support 9,000 pounds per foot as projected along the horizontal here. Um, for an arch that's spanning 100 feet and has a rise of 25 feet. So this arch has a stress in it and the highest stress is down near the base here where it's slightly higher than up there, but the actual stress under this load condition at that span with that rise is well within the capacity of the wood that composes the arch. And so we would say it, it has a safety factor that would uh, assure us that when we put this 9,000 pounds per foot load on it, um, it will be safely within the capacity of this arch. Now, if we say, well, we designed that arch to be an arch, but now we're going to ask what happens when we remove the buttressing force. So we are, here we have our free body again, which is half of that curved element, structural element, and it has the buttressing force H on it. And this horizontal force and that horizontal force are creating a counterclockwise influence, which is uh, counteracting the clockwise influence of these vertical forces. These horizontal forces have a pretty decent lever arm. It's the depth, or excuse me, the rise of the curved element or the arch. Now in the diagram below, we've removed this horizontal force. So we have this unbalanced inclination for clockwise motion. And the only thing that could possibly resist that is some kind of stress distribution on this cross section. So there's something there that's happening that's tending to produce this counterclockwise motion, and that's what's balancing out this tendency towards clockwise motion induced by uh, these vertical forces. So if we go through the analysis and figure this out and we will talk in detail about how this comes about but on this interface here we will have something called a bending stress where we have high compression on the top high tension on the bottom and those things diminish linearly to zero at the center of the beam this is called the bending distribution now we'd like to ask ourselves how bad are these stresses we have some huge bending stress and compression there and a huge bending stress in tension here. How bad are they compared to the compression that we would have gotten um, for the other situation? So in other words, we want to compare the axial stress at the base of this arch to the bending stress at the center of this beam. This has the shape of an arch, but it is not acting at all like an arch because it does not have the buttressing force that creates the compression uh, tangent to the member at the support point. So when we do that analysis, this is the axial stress at the base of the arch, which we call F sub A for axial. Um, it's so low in this diagram that all we could show were the arrowheads of the stress arrows. In contrast, drawing at exactly the same scale, this is the bending stress. So you see enormous bending stresses compared to these axial stresses. 
So in other words, the removal of the buttressing force is increasing the stress from here to there, which is approximately a factor of 35. And of course, if it was originally designed where this was strong enough but not overly designed, then when we apply a stress, a bending stress like this, we will have instantaneous failure of the member. So the buttressing force is very important. So let's talk about where we can get the buttressing force. This is a um, beautiful bridge designed by a Swiss engineer named Maillard. Um, basically, the buttressing force comes from this huge mountain of stone. And so in the design of this bridge, the engineer had to convince himself that his bridge was not going to push that mountain around. And in fact, this bridge has been there for quite a while. So apparently his deduction that that mountain was big enough turned out to be correct. Uh, we can also get the buttressing force uh, as is done in this building. This is the Broadgate Exchange Building in London. Uh, which was designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. It basically is a 10-story building that spans one city block. The support structure is this arch, but that's a sort of simplistic way of saying it because that arch won't behave like an arch unless there's a tie member down along the bottom. So in fact, when we look down at the base, we see this is the bottom of that arch coming down, and this is the steel tie member that's holding that together and keeping it from splaying outward. So this tie member is providing the horizontal buttressing force that allows this thing to do its job. Here's another example. This is the Moscone uh, exhibition space in San Francisco. Uh, it's spanning an entire city block in both directions. Uh, it's out in front of City Hall. Um, there's a, an open plaza there which has trees and large amounts of dirt to support the the root ball for those trees, but also that's a plaza that can be filled by huge numbers of people. It has to be designed for at least 100 pounds or maybe even 150 pounds a square foot. So enormous live loads from the people plus the weight of the concrete that's supporting that whole plaza. So enormous forces, very long span. In this case, there is a tension member that runs under the floor. Uh, for every one of these arches. So at the end of an arch there or there, that tension member has got to engage the bottom of that arch to produce whatever force is necessary to keep that arch in compression. So whatever the cross section of this arch is, by the time it gets down to the bottom, that entire amount of material has to be engaged by whatever this tension member is that's running under the concrete. In the case of this particular structure, um, the steel reinforcing that runs under the concrete slab was post-tension, so the, the uh, arches are cast in place in formwork. Uh, the steel tie member was post-tension to the point that the arch actually rose up off of the formwork, and the formwork could be easily removed at that point. But it's also very reassuring because the structure is supporting itself and you know it's supporting itself before you even start pulling the form work out. Uh, Post-tensioning also assures there's not too much settlement of the arch, which might produce some cracking or stress distribution. Um, at the base, we might have a, a, a vault, which is very wide. So in the case of this structure, the entire roof structure is in compression that roof structure is coming down and suddenly we want to reroute those stresses because we want to op open this up for architectural purposes. So this is a beautiful example where we see stresses being rerouted in a very elegant way to get them into these buttressing elements. These buttressing elements go down underground where they encounter a tie member that holds the structure together. So let's ask what happens when we don't have that tie member. Um, and we don't have anything to buttress it. This is the Colosseum in Rome. You'll notice there's an inner ring of complete arches. Every one of these arches buttresses the adjacent arch. So they're all working great. Uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire, though, people began to scrounge materials out of the Colosseum. 
and you'll notice the outer ring has been mostly removed and the only portion that remains is over on this side. And so we want to go look at what happens at the end here um, when that material gets removed. As soon as people started taking material away from this outer ring, it beca became uh, fairly unstable. So for example, these last few arches had no buttressing benefit. So this arch has begun to spread and these columns are tilting outward and huge cracks are developing in the in the structure up above and what eventually stabilized this was people coming back in and building this huge buttressing element and also building in basically a bearing wall inside of these arches to keep them from spreading outward and collapsing downward so that buttressing effect is tremendously important now some places in classical architecture, or say in Islamic architecture in Spain, you see a whole series of arches, and those arches could mutually brace each other, except the last arch isn't braced. So in Alhambra, for example, you see tension elements that are running all along the bottom here, and they have to go all the way from one side to the other, because even if you just tied these two arches together, this arch is not buttressed and it can push all that structure over. So that's how it was done in Alhambra and you see a mass of these tension members. This structure has somehow accomplished all of this without those tension members. So when you look at a structure like this, you have to immediately say, what, what is the actual structural action here? Because this arch right here could easily push that column over. And when you go look at it in detail, you discover that in fact, it's not an arch at all. The primary structure is steel. This is a slender steel pipe, which supports a beam, which goes over to the next steel pipe. And this beam is a very lightweight, 10 inch deep steel beam. And all of this massive structure is actually super lightweight steel, coal form steel framing, with some sheathing on it, and then it's covered with a, a plaster material, a stucco material. So all of this is just fake uh, to make it look like arches. So it's clad in these big round uh, sculpted uh, elements that make it look like classical kind of uh, columns um, and massive, apparently massive arches above that. But in fact, it's just some flimsy uh, steel columns and steel beams. Now, um, as we said, we can always uh, buttress or, or provide the buttressing force for any of these compression members by running a time member from one support point for the compression member to the other. Um, if that time member is rendered as light as it can be, which from a point of view of how the whole system acts, we're going to ask how much tensile force does it have to generate? It will not be sufficiently tensioned to even appear to be horizontal at that point. We will get droop of those tension members and to make it look like the building is not just warped out of shape, we'll use something called tie rods where we hang that tension member, which is very limp, off of the arch in order to maintain the shape of the system. Now, now we've got a bunch of tension members that are crisscrossing through the space. And then we got all these uh, tie rods or these uh, sag rods coming down. So we have the potential for this beautiful uh, volume, which is now cluttered with all kinds of stuff that we'd probably rather not have there. So, how can we get rid of that? Well, one of the ways we can do it is we can pull out all those tension members, but then we have to replace them with something. So in this case, what I've drawn is a very deep horizontal truss, and it is absorbing the horizontal thrust of each of these uh, compression members. So these curved compression members that are acting as arches, are arriving at this point, the vertical force is provided by these columns, 
and the horizontal force is provided by these uh, compression struts in this horizontal truss. Um, architecturally, this is not too obtrusive, uh, too obtrusive because this truss can be buried up in the ceiling panel. Uh, we can either express it or not express it, but because we have a fairly wide space here from there to there, we have a very deep horizontal truss which can handle efficiently the horizontal thrust of the arches that are spanning the main space. Now, we might want to open up the space even more. Here we were trying to clear out the volume up above, but we might want more free flow of people through here. In other words, we may not want this forest or this line of columns there. So we can replace that line of columns with a truss. So here we have a vertical uh, parallel cord truss, which is absorbing the vertical component that's, that's involved when the arches arrive at that support point, and then the horizontal component is absorbed by the horizontal truss. So we have two trusses perpendicular to each other, one of which is intended to provide the vertical support component for the ends of those curved arches, and the other is intended to provide the horizontal or the buttressing force. We can also look at this parallel cord truss and ask ourselves, is it the best shape? And would we produce a more interesting architectural space if we curved that roof form and made it more like a bow truss? Um, so this is an alternate option that one would have to examine. They're both very efficient, very logical. Um, so this would more be a sort of um, alternate architectural expression. So here we have an example of exactly that. We have a series of arches which are arriving here and there's both horizontal and these sloped trusses which are tending to pick up all the components of those um, arches in their action and all those loads are getting delivered back here and then we have this one tension member it's a pretty fat tension member and that would make sense because if you think about it in the original structure we had a whole bunch of these tension members that were absorbing the outward thrust of all those arches. Now we've replaced those with two tension members, this one and that one. And these two tension members have to be able to do everything that the, the large number of, of tension members did in the original structure. So now we end up all these arch elements are creating these horizontal components and all of that is getting concentrated into this member right here. This member also is probably tubular and probably made of larger diameter than was necessary just to reduce the tendency to droop. Now we can have variations in the internal force in a truss and we will so um, and we want to understand what the implications of that are. This is a parallel cord truss. Here we have a bottom cord. Here we have a top cord. They are parallel to each other which is what leads to this name parallel cord truss. Um, these are very easy to manufacture. Um, they're extremely common and they are capable of quite high efficiency. Here we have an alternate shape, which is an arch-shaped top cord, or we call this a bow truss in this case, because we have a bottom cord, we have a top cord, and then we have a bunch of truss elements or web members in between. This bow truss is deeper at the center, so presumably the horizontal forces that are going to be occurring in the top cord and the bottom cord have a bigger lever arm and so this should be structurally more efficient and logical than that. And we're going to discover that actually is the case. This is the loading condition. Here we have twice as many top cord vertices. So we've put one kip per vertex. Here we have half as many vertices. So we put two kips per vertex. But along the whole length of the arch or the spanning member, uh, the load is essentially the same for these two cases. When we perform the analysis, which in this case was done on a computer, but we can do this by hand also. Um, but when we perform this analysis, uh, 
These elements right here we call flags. So the original geometry looked like the following. Uh, here are the members, that spacing apart. Uh, in this case, these are the members right here and right there. Bottom cord, top cord. All of this is called a flag. And that flag, its vertical dimension is in proportion to the magnitude of the force in that member. So in this case, we have these really tall flags here that say the compressive force in this is very large. Huge flags here that say the tensile force in this, these two members is very large. The compressive force in the top core diminishes downward to a very small value near the end. The tensile force in the bottom core diminishes downward to essentially zero, actually, in that member right there. So we have huge variations. We generally don't like that because um, we don't want to vary the cross section of this member to resist this huge force there and then a much smaller force there. If this truss is 60 feet or less in length, we'll have one continuous member across the top. We will have to size that member to deal with this force right here as opposed to that force. So when we get to the end of the truss, the member is drastically oversized and we perceive that as an inefficient use of material. Um, in the case of the bow truss, two things to notice is none of these flags are as large as that, which says we've used this deeper lever arm. So the depth of this is that as opposed to this depth right here. Um, the deeper lever arm has allowed us to drastically reduce the cord forces in the bow truss as, a, as opposed to the parallel cord truss. But also notice something else. The tensile force is absolutely constant in this bottom cord, and it's almost constant in the top cord. This force right here and that force right there are a little bit larger than these forces here. But if we curve a member of constant cross section across the top of this um, bow truss, we're going to have very efficient use of material because it's never going to be oversized. We will size it for this worst case, and then it'll be slightly oversized here. In addition to this issue of non-uniform depth, we'd like to make the point that leverage is really important for structural action and in particular for structural efficiency. So here we're looking at a load condition of some distributed load W. Um, here we're um, resolving that into a vertical component. A very shallow uh, arch has to have a compressive force that has this slope and it has a very large horizontal component. If we go to a deeper truss that has a higher slope there, we cut that horizontal component in half. So instead of being this long, it's only that long. And likewise, when we double it again, we cut the horizontal component in, in half again. So all that says that all other things being equal, we'd rather have a deeper arch than a shallower arch. However, uh, there are practical limits to that. For example, if we make this curved element really tall, then these web members become very long. We're consuming more material on them than we want to, and they're going to be more vulnerable to buckling. So for lightly loaded situations, such as this roofing system, this bow truss will generally be of about these proportions. It's not a really tall curvilinear element. It's not a tall arch, um, but it still will work fine because the loads will be less than 10 pounds a square foot for dead load and less than 20 pounds a square foot for snow or live load of people walking around working on the roof and repairing the roof. Um, so generally speaking, we'll have proportions something like this. In this case, we have massively different loads. Um, we have 10 floors. Uh, 50 pounds a square foot probably of concrete floor slab, uh, 
probably another 80 pounds a square foot of human live load. Uh, and then you multiply that by 10. So the loads are much higher here. And in the design of this building, the designers took advantage of the opportunity to make this arch much taller, giving it a much higher rise, which makes it a much more efficient structure. This is the Broadgate Exchange House in London, which was designed by Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. We have issues of lateral stability relative to arches. If they're not braced, they can buckle to the side. So one way to handle that is to make the cross section of the arch really wide. And this would be an example of that. So the width of the arch is allowing it to remain stable. It has to be attached wherever it's attached to the footings so that it cannot keel over from one side to the other. So there has to be a good sturdy moment connection at that base. Uh, in this case, the width was getting much, much wider. Um, we didn't need all that material to handle the gravity stresses that are induced in it. We needed all that width for lateral stability. And an elegant way to deal with that was rather than have a solid uh, arch that gets wider and wider at the base, uh, it split apart into these two uh, legs that became the source of stability. Um, we can also stabilize an arch by lacing it to another arch. So here we have a bunch of horizontal elements that are moment connected to these arches and this rigid frame or ladder structure helps to stabilize these uh, compression elements against lateral movement. This is a similar concept except these joints have been accentuated. Um, here's another way of accentuating the joints which is instead of putting fillets in there, we just taper it in a way where it's wider at the connection point. We can also lace two arches together with truss work. Um, and and that, that truss work can be of almost any configuration as long as it's fully triangulated. And finally, uh, for architectural applications, this works really well. We can laterally stabilize a series of arches by putting a uh, diaphragm roof on them. So in this case, these would be pretty flimsy arches that would tend to collapse to the side very easily, but they're attached to a diaphragm roof. So there's a, a nice synergism here that's along the lines of things we've already talked about, which is the arches are resisting the vertical forces and the roof diaphragm is resisting the horizontal forces. And those two things are working together to provide a more stable structure against forces in any possible direction. We need to concern ourselves also with the vertical stabilization of an arch. An arch under uniform load can fail by what we call roll through buckling. So this portion starts to collapse inward, that portion starts to bulge outward, and this is what we call the roll through deformation. Um, so there's an inward sag here and that begins to induce bending stresses because the original shape was this, but as it flattens out, we end up with tension and compression associated with bending. And likewise, the original curvature here was that, and as it becomes more curved, uh, bending stresses are induced. So one way to, to deal with that issue is to just make that structure deeper so it has better bending qualities. So in this case, this vertical stabilization is occurring through the depth of this arch, and then the lateral stabilization is occurring through this truss work pattern, similar to what we've already talked about. Here's another example where the arch element is made deeper so it has better bending traits so that it's more resistive to roll through buckling. Um, here is a semicircular element which is trussed so that we get some structural depth to handle the roll through buckling and the bending problem. Here we have a barrel vault uh, which tends to be pretty stiff in resisting forces in the direction of the finger here uh, but not so strong in the other direction so to stiffen it in the other direction and keep it from rolling through uh, we can add ribs like this. Sometimes we can get away with just putting them at the end, but 
that still leaves the center part of this arch a little bit vulnerable to, especially to uh, wind forces on that surface. So we may want to put ribs that deepen it in every direction. So this is the field house at Dartmouth uh, in New Hampshire, which was designed by Pierre Luigi Nervi. And it has these crisscrossing ribs that stiffen it uh, against roll through. We can also stiffen it against roll through by interrupting the roof diaphragm. So we have a lower surface for the roof, which is here, and then a higher surface, and then another lower surface that you can't see, and then a higher surface. And those lower and higher surfaces have been knit together with this rigid frame structure, which gives much greater depth and bending strength uh, to this vault relative to roll through deformation. Here's another example. Here we have an arch at a lower level, an arch at a higher level, or a vault uh, at a higher level. And uh, individually, they tend to be pretty flimsy. But if we add truss work, uh, we stiffen them dramatically. Uh, the outer edge of this might still be a, a little weak. Uh, if we've got a good enough grade beam, we can stabilize that edge by just putting vertical elements there. But if the grade beam's not stiff enough, we may want to introduce this kind of element down at this level, which would be a very efficient way to do it. It does have the disadvantage that there are architectural benefits to being able to enter the building through any of these openings, and a tension member there could interrupt some of the architectural flexibility. Here we have another example. This is a very slender compression element with a tension element across the bottom here. That's the primary means of gravity uh, load resistance uh, to keep this arch from roll through buckling. Truss work has been provided on the outside. In this case, the geometry of that truss work and the variable depth was set by the fact that the designers wanted to have a constant slope to the external roof so that they could shingle the glazing and be assured that they would not have a significant amount of leakage. So they wanted a simple sloped outer surface, but they felt like designing a truss that looked that way would be too boring. So they got the best of both worlds in that they got the flat slope surface for the outside to deal with water, and they got this beautiful curvilinear element to deal with gravity. And I think when you're there, your eye is drawn more to this curve than it is to the sloped, uh, flat slope roof. And as a consequence, the space tends to be uh, quite pleasing visually. Here's another kind of funky example of that, where we have a curvilinear element that's the sort of the primary structural element. In this case, it's arch-like, and then a piece of it becomes more cantilever-like. But again, there's all this truss work, which is stabilizing those elements under their gravity loads. Here's another interesting example. We have a very slender arch, which would be vulnerable to roll through buckling. We have a beam here, which is not deep enough to span. In other words, this beam is fairly shallow compared to the rise of this arch. So the arch is much better for spanning from that point to that point. But this beam is deep enough that through these vertical connectors, it helps to stabilize this arch against through, roll through buckling. So there's a kind of strange synergism here where the beam is hanging off of the arch under uniform gravity load. But then the beam is stiff enough that it's helping the arch avoid this roll through failure mode. Here's another way of bracing um, in the vertical plane. Um, this is an arc of a circle in which this material was formed through a rolling process. And then these web members help to stabilize that against the roll through buckling. Now, I show this diagram again to emphasize the nature of roll through buckling. All the really interesting stuff is happening at the quarter points. This is tending to collapse inward and flatten out. This is tending to uh, uh, bulge upward and develop more curvature. And so the big bending stresses are here and there. And that's where most of the movement is occurring. Uh, 
So in the case of this building, they wanted to minimize this bracing. So they went up to the quarter points and basically stabilized those quarter points. And that allowed them to make this arch much shallower and I think much more elegant. Here's another way of dealing with the quarter points. Uh, here we have a continuous, this is one arc on the outside. And then there's a different arc of a circle here and a different arc of a circle there. And then by trussing them together, there's enough depth to give the bending capacity at the quarter points that's necessary to stabilize it. This again is the bridge. Uh, Meyer did numerous examples of this kind of bridge where it's really thick at the quarter points in order to resist the roll through buckling. He also accentuated the shallowness there and there, and even at the center, if you go and examine this bridge, you see that this deep rail, which is to keep um, automobiles from riding off of, driving off of the bridge, it looks very deep, but it's actually, there's a slice through it, and the only compression is carried in the thin part of the arch that comes across here. And the reason for doing that is, first of all, the material is more than strong enough to handle the compressive stresses that are occurring there. But the real risk in a bridge like this is uh, on a hot summer day, the sun beats down on it and it expands a lot. And then on a really cold winter night, it contracts a lot. And each of these thin parts becomes like a hinge. So this is what we call a three hinged arch and it's actually stress relieving itself relative to those thermal effects. So returning to this idea of a barrel vault, we said it's very weak relative to forces in that direction and it deforms really easily. Um, we can take two barrel vaults at 90 degrees to each other and intersect them. And that process of intersecting means that this vault, which is strong in this direction, is bracing this one against roll through. And likewise, this one, which is strong in that direction, is bracing that one against roll through. And that is such a profoundly effective process that we're actually able to go and remove all the material underneath here, which gives us this wonderful uh, daylit space, which has light coming from four different directions. This is what we call a quadripartite cross vault or groin vault. Uh, we can do a tripart a vault, cross vault, a sexpartite cross vault, and so forth. Uh, this is a quadra quadro uh, a four part um, groin vault or cross vault at uh, the library at Duke University uh, and here is the similar kind of effect in the Duke Chapel. So what are the common shapes for arches and vaults? Um, parabolas, catenaries, and semicircle. The parabola is the right shape for a load that is uniformly distributed along the horizontal. The catenary is the right shape for an arch that's where the load is uniform along the length of the arch. And the semicircle is actually not the right shape for anything um, except possibly um, the cross-sectional shape of uh, the fuselage of a plane or more appropriately um, a, some sort of submersible where the stress in it or the force or stress in every direction on the surface is radially inward. That's where a semicircle works well. Um, if we squash all that down, we can still have a catenary and a parabola, uh, but the arc of a circle or the semicircle then becomes an ellipse. Um, semicircles and ellipses are really horrible from a point of view of trying to actually be an arch. They end up with all kinds of bending stress and deformation. So here, for example, the, the appropriate shape for this would be a catenary because the load here is the self-weight of these wooden blocks. Um, in this case, by the way, we are getting a buttressing force here because there's sandpaper at the base of this, which is providing uh, that horizontal component. So all this material in the center here is what we call centering. It supports, supports the arch while we're assembling it and constructing it. Once it's assembled, we can lower the centering out of the way and this arch remains stable. And in fact, we can push it this way and then we can push it that way and it always comes back to its neutral state. So we have the right shape here and the arch is stable.
For a uniform load along the horizontal, the correct shape is a parabola. In this case, we have, for every one of these vertical elements, we have the enormous force that represents uh, this section of the building, which is 10 stories tall and in width equal to a bay. We have that for every one of these verticals. So where they uh, attach to this arch, uh, they are producing a point force, and the point forces are all of equal magnitude, and they're equally spaced. Uh, the appropriate shape for this is a parabola, and this arch is precisely a parabola. So it's the appropriate funicular shape. If we go to a semicircle, we have centering again that is supporting it while we construct it. When we start lowering the centering, it is not a stable uh, arch. It's not functioning as an arch. It's beginning to bulge outward and crack here, bulge outward and crack there, and then collapse inward and develop cracks on the bottom here. So it's telling us how it's not functioning correctly and the stress line is not going through it. So the stress line here is going through that connection point and then up at the top it's coming to the outside and then it's coming through this point and it's if you if you draw that path it's closer to a parabola or a, a catenary than it is to a semicircle. We have beautiful examples from classical architecture. Uh, this is a semicircular arch. It was semicircular when it was created. It worked in that case first because it has a lot of extra load right here that's tending to push down on the part that wants to bulge up. But all this material is also wedged in between, so all this compressive stone is, is inhibiting the horizontal component of this bulging process. It's bulging in that direction, which means it's bulging upward and it's bulging to the side. As long as all that material is properly wedged in there, everything works right. Uh, as soon as you have earthquakes that start to move that material, when this wedged in material begins to move about, then we begin to see these uh, rather grotesque deformations where we have cracks on the bottom of this arch and cracks on the outside of the arch at the quarter points. Uh, this is a terrible problem in a masonry structure where you can't you don't have tensile case capability in the stone. If we go to modern materials, though, where we have tensile materials, it's not difficult to design around this problem. But we need to we need to know that we're going to have tension in the bottom material here and tension on the upper material on these quarter points. And fortunately, steel works extremely well in that capacity. Um, this is an arc of a circle. It's not the ideal shape, but when we add all these web members, it works great because the web members are more than strong enough to hold it in its shape. Um, and the arc of a circle is the classic way we make this because it's very easy to run this material through a roller that produces that shape. Um, here's an example of an elliptical structure. Uh, this is the train station in Berlin, the people who designed this. One of these curvilinear elements, these elliptical elements, to be slender, but they knew that um, they were going to be uh, tremendously taxed in terms of this bending stress problem. And so they came up with this very elegant and expressive way of dealing with it, where they said, we know the center part wants to collapse downward, so we're going to create this lenticular truss with a tensile sling element right here that holds that up. We know this part wants to bulge outward, and we're going to put this tension sling around it with these compression struts that are basically pushing back in on that to hold it in its shape. Um, we call this shape, by the way, the moment diagram, and we'll talk more about what that means. But this building is basically the moment diagram for this shape. Very elegant, very beautiful. but. Uh, certainly not the most direct or logical solution, but it allowed them to have the elliptical shape, which is what they wanted from a sort of aesthetic and emotional point of view, and then to show that they understood enough about structures that they were able to patch that up and make it work. That ends our uh, fourth video having to do with compression, axial compression members, in this case, axial compression for spanning.